the men if you'd like. Please stand with us as we're going to read together Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. If you can put that up on the screen for us. Let's read together. They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And with him will be called his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Amen. All right, thank you. All right, so we're celebrating the birth of Christ. And, and I, I use that language a little uh, on purpose or purposefully because sometimes we say Merry Christmas and we're not exactly sure what that means. You know, we're thinking, okay, Merry gifts, Merry days off from work, right? <laughs> all, those, all those are legitimate. But when we're talking about Christmas, we're talking about the birth of Jesus Christ, the most important day, arguably, in the history of the world. It's when we celebrate the coming of the Son of God in human flesh, came to the world, ultimately to give his life in exchange for ours, to be resurrected, and to declare victory. And so as we see in the book of Revelation, at the end of the day, we are, through Jesus Christ, victorious. And when you think about it, it's quite a story. Right. The idea that there was a woman who was a virgin impregnated by the Holy Spirit with the son of God. And Jesus comes and puts on a flesh suit. He gives up all that is heaven on behalf of us. And so today we want to talk more about that and understand how what he did through his birth, how it changed our lives forever. And so please join me as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks. Giving, we give you praise, glory, and honor. God, I thank you for this day where we celebrate, recognize, and acknowledge what you did. We thank you, Lord God, that we can reflect on your coming. And today, Lord God, as I talk about why you came and its implications, God, I ask that you open up our hearts and minds to be receptive. Open up our minds to understand the scriptures. Open up our ears, Lord God, to, see, to understand what you're saying and transform us. Help us to be who you've called, created us to be. As we celebrate you, acknowledge you, and thank you for being God today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so let's jump in it. We got a lot to cover. We're doing baptism today. I'm so excited about that. And I'm really excited that the water is warm this time because last time that water was rough. But the water's warm, and we um, know you have to be home by three. So we're going to go ahead and get into the word and keep moving. All right, so the sermon in a sentence this week. Jesus was born as a baby, but he came to be king. Jesus was born, yes, as a baby, but he came to be king. The imagery often that people have of Jesus is sweet little baby Jesus, little lamb Jesus, and all of that. And to some extent, that's true. But the truth of the matter is Jesus came to be king. And so the scriptures confirm that if we go to the book of Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 33, the angel was speaking to uh, Mary. And he says, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive. And give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus and he will be great. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and his kingdom will never end. And so we see the promise that God was making to Mary. She said, the baby that you're going to carry will be great. And in fact, he's going to rule over not only his people, but he's going to rule over the entire world and his reign will never, ever end. And so as we think about Jesus's birth and we talk about the season being Advent, where we look not just to the first coming, but the second coming of Jesus Christ. So not only did Jesus come, but he's going to come back again. And that's what we've been reading in the book of Revelation about the second coming. And then Jesus is going to return and the scripture says he has all power in his hand and the enemy will be defeated. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, or wise men, came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born who? King of the Jews. We saw his, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And so the proper response to who Jesus is as king is to worship him. So when we think about Jesus, it's not little baby Jesus, but it's Jesus king, Jesus Lord, Jesus one who is to be worshipped. 
John chapter 18, verse 37. And this is Jesus standing before Pilate when he was about to be killed. He was about to be sacrificed. And Pilate said to him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered and said, you are correct that I am. You say correctly that I am a king. For this purpose I have been born. And for this I have come into the world. To testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then finally, last week's memory verse, Revelation 11, chapter, verse 15, the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in the heavens shouting, the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever. And so we see from the beginning all the way in Matthew to the end in Revelation that Jesus came, and yes, he was born as a baby, but he came to be king. And so the question that we want to address this morning, why did Jesus come? What is the reason? So he's king. That's great. But why did he come? And so first and foremost, Jesus came, according to John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, he came to demonstrate God's love for us and to save us from our sins. Any sinners in the house today? Former sinners. I went to our current ones. I'm like, former sinners. sinners. (laughs) Current two, are we still at it? This morning? Got you. All right. For God so what? Loved the world. That he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal or everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So many people think that Jesus came to be destructive. And while we're reading Revelation, that ultimately there's judgment for people's um, decision to reject God. And if you're reading All of these things are going on. It's fascinating to me. But the Bible continues to say, but they would not repent. They see all the things going on. They see God's love. And the Bible says, and they still would not and did not repent of their sins. And so the Bible says God loved us so much, the entire world. Not a few people, not select people, not just you, me, my four, not no more. But in fact, he loved the entire world. And in response and because of his love, it says he gave his son. First John chapter four, verses nine and ten. God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. He says this is the definition of love. This is real love. It's not that we love God. You see, we act like we do something. We're like, well, I, I decided to give my life to Jesus. It's like, wow, really? <laughs> he says without his drawing, without his love. We have no love and says his love came. He says, this is real love. Not that we love God. That's the appropriate response, right? When we think about God as creator, God as provider, God is all that is done for us. Of course, we should love God. But the question is, why should God love us? In light of our sin, in light of what we've done, in light of what we do, why in the world would God love us? But it says this is real love. It's not that we love God, but he loved us. And he sent his son as a sacrifice. To take away our sins. He sent his son to die to pay the price for your sin and mine. And that's why Jesus came. Luke chapter 19 verse 10. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Seek, look for. Save, rescue. Lost, not where it's supposed to be. You see, sometimes we use this word lost like these people are are out there and they're living wild and God doesn't care about them and so forth. But it's no, no, no. He's saying, listen. You ever lose anything? Right? You ever lose your keys? What happens when you lose your keys? It's stressful, right? Your heart starts beating real fast. You start sweating. You get nervous. And nothing else is important. But God forbid you lose your phone. Amen? Like, forget the keys, but the phone. And so you lose that phone and everything comes to a halt. Or if you, ever, if you have kids or you have a little somebody you're watching or a nephew or niece and you're ever at the mall or at the store and you lose that kid. Any, any parents ever lose a kid? Let me see. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Call the people on the, on the pollards. Hold on a second. Right? You, that kid is missing and what happens? Panic. Panic. Right? And so God is saying, listen, Jesus came to rescue that which was lost. Not where we're supposed to be. 
Not that God was, is excited about punishing us or, or desiring. He says, listen, he died and gave his son for the world. Amen. And there's hope. And in fact, the reason the Bible says he hasn't even come back yet, he says he desires for everyone to be saved. Amen. He says, don't think that God is slow, but he's giving opportunity for people to come back to him. And so he came to seek, search, it was a search and rescue mission. You remember when that, it was a plane went down, I think, in the Indian Ocean, and it was a multinational search looking to find that plane. And a little boy who got lost in the woods, and there were people from everywhere trying to find him. When we were lost, Jesus was sent by the Father on a search and rescue mission because we were missing, and the Father wanted us back home. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and then 4 through 5. As for you, so he's demonstrating our love. As for you, as for me, we were dead in our transgressions and our sins. We were done. It was a wrap. Verse 4 says, but, right? We said but is one of the largest words in the English language because it erases everything that was before it. So, so we were dead in our sins, but because of his great love for us, because of the love that God had for you, because of his love for me, God who is rich in mercy. Anybody need mercy? You know, mercy is when you do something and you don't get to whooping. Yeah. Amen? Right? Mercy. He says, so he's rich in mercy. He made us alive in Christ that even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace, God's favor, unearned, unmerited, undeserved, that you're saved. Couldn't buy it. Certainly couldn't afford it. But because of his love. First John, secondly, to destroy Satan and his power over us. So in addition to Jesus coming to demonstrate God's love for us and to save us from our sins, the second reason he came was to destroy Satan and his power over us. 1 John 3 and 8 says, He who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. He says the reason that he showed up was to destroy the devil's work. You realize hunger is the devil's work. Sickness is the devil's work. Death is the devil's work. It says the reason that God sent his son, the reason Jesus showed up was to destroy the devil's work. Anybody got any devil's work going on in your life? Amen. I didn't say you know, people. I said the devil's work. <laughs> talking about your kids and stuff, right? The devil's work it says the reason that Jesus showed up was to destroy the devil's work. Satan's attack against our life. Jesus came to deal with that. The sickness in our bodies. The stress in our minds. The poverty that people experience. It says that Jesus came to destroy that work. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 to 15. Because God's children are human beings. Made of flesh and blood. The son became flesh and blood as well. You see the original plan was for us. As the children of God, as his creation, and we're going to start in the book of Genesis uh, two weeks from now, we'll see that the God's design and intention was for us, <laughs> you got your reading plan, that's good, was for us to have dominion over the earth, to be God's representatives on the earth, and to rule the earth on God's behalf. And the earth was intended to be a colony of the kingdom of heaven. When we gave up our rule and dominion over the earth to Satan, God's plan still didn't change. And so because the plan stayed the same, he had to come himself in the form of a human being because a human being was supposed to exercise dominion. And so Jesus came in flesh and blood. For only a human being could, die, could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. So Jesus' death broke the devil's power over us. You know, the reason we say this all the time, the reason that we sin, the devil can't make us sin. He can give us opportunity. He can tempt us. But we sin because we choose to. Amen? Say that with me. I sin <laughs> because I want to. Say it a little louder. I'm not convinced. <laughs> say I sin because I want to. Hey, there you go. Like I'm grown. I sin because I want to. Amen? But Jesus came to break the power of the devil, who had the power of death. And only in this way could he set free all who have lived 
their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. One of the greatest fears that people have, that human beings have, is the fear of death. He says the reason Jesus came was in part to destroy our fear of death. We don't have to be afraid of dying. Because the Bible tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So worst case scenario, when we as believers, as citizens of the kingdom of God, when we die, we immediately are in the presence of God. Worst case scenario. It's good stuff. John 10 and 10, the thief, those false teachers who are led by the devil, it says he, they do not come, but they come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, the reason that I came is that you can have abundant life. Full life. Life now. Not in the future, not later, not in heaven. Heaven will take care of itself. Right? Doesn't it make sense that if it was about just about heaven, that when we got saved, when we surrendered our lives to Christ, that we would die and go to heaven? But it's about so much more than heaven. It's about here and now. And so the abundant life that God has for us is we should be experiencing abundant life now. Doesn't mean that everybody will be rich or famous and like that, but we should still have full and complete life. Do you realize there are people all over the world who don't have nearly as much as we have who have full life? There are people who enjoy life, people who are happy with life. There are people who have a lot less than you have, a lot less than I have, who are happy, who are full, who are complete. And so God's design is for us that here and now that we will have abundant life. Does anybody here have abundant life, full life? Life that you enjoy, life that you love. That's the life that God designed for us through relationship with his son. And then Romans 16, 20, he's real clear. He says, listen, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. I like that. <laughs> he says the God of peace will crush Satan under you your feet. The grace, the favor of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And then where we're focusing our energy today and, and last week, the third one is to give us a new identity. To change who we are at core. Second Corinthians 5 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, Christ means king. If anyone is in Christ, a part of his family has become one with him. He is a new creation. The old has passed away and see, the new has come. He says the old you, the you that couldn't control your mouth. You know that you, if somebody says something to you, you had to see them and raise them one. You know that violent you. You know that pick a fight you. You know that get your feelings hurt, easy you. You know that not nice you. He says, if anyone be in Christ, he says, we are brand new. Amen. And so even that baggage that we brought into life with us, right, that five-piece Louis Vuitton set on the wheels, he says that baggage, when we surrender our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we are made brand new. And so those things that have happened in our past, we're over, able to overcome them. Those people who we couldn't stand, couldn't deal with, we're able, the Bible says, in fact, to love them. Our entire life is transformed. It's made brand new when we are in Christ. And so when Jesus came, he came to give us a new identity. First John chapter three, verse one or verse three says, see what great love the father has lavished on us. This is one of our memory verses, I believe. See what great love the father is identifying our relationship to God. See what great love that the father has lavished on us, poured out on us overwhelmed us with that we should be called what? And then it affirms and says what? Do you understand the gravity of that statement? So if I said, oh man, you were the children of Oprah, you'd be like, oh Lord. The children of Jordan. Oh my goodness. The children of Buffett. That'd be interesting, right? <laughs> there are some names that they were called, you would be, you'd be elated. Why? Because you're like, oh, I'm rich, I'm famous. Well, said, the Bible says we are the children of God. Does that resonate with you, that you are a child of the creator of the universe? Yes. The one who has all authority, all power in his hand? Yes. The one who directs the wind? 
The one who the Bible says all the cattle on a thousand hills is his, says the gold is his, the silver is his, says the whole world is his. That's the one we're talking about. He says, that's who's your daddy. If that doesn't change your identity, I'm not sure I understand what will. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Do you realize you were a slave, a citizen of the kingdom of darkness? You didn't have a choice with regard to the devil's instruction. You did what you were instructed to do. But he says, when Jesus came, he rescued us from the dominion, the rule of darkness. The punishment, the disregard, the low self-esteem, the devaluing, says he rescued us from that darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son whom he loves. We call that the kingdom of God in whom we have redemption. We've been redeemed. Somebody has paid for our sin, the price, and the forgiveness of our sins. Our sins are wiped clean. We're no longer held guilty for the things that we've done. Ephesians 4, 22 and 24 says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. When you are redeemed, when your identity is changed, it means your old self gets put away. Your sick self, your angry self, your mean self, your stressed self, your anxious self, your depressed self. It says being corrupted by his deceitful desires to be what made new in our thinking, to be made new in the attitude of our minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness, in right relationship with him, living life as he intended it and holiness, living separate, set apart from him, set apart from the world, set apart for him. That's what it means when he says new identity. And then finally, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So today, as we baptize this this afternoon, the symbolism here is when Jesus died, and he was put into the ground, that's the representation of baptism, right? That we are buried with Christ. And then when we come up, we are resurrected with him. It says we were buried through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. Our old life has passed away. We have a brand new life. We have a life of power. We have a life of vision. We have a life of wisdom. Our life is forever changed because of our relationship with Christ. And so baptism was a symbol or a statement that you belonged to someone else. You could be baptized into the name of different gods. You could be baptized for a country. You could be baptized, but it was a statement that I now belong to this new country. And just like the oath of naturalization, we talk about that all the time, that when you say you become a citizen of the United States, you have to renounce your former country. You denounce, abjure, you reject. You say, I will now support what? The Constitution of the United States of America. So I reject my former life. And so baptism was really the way how you announced that you were a follower of Jesus Christ. And that was what rejected you from the Jewish family and rejected you from Rome. And so when you became a Christian, you were announcing that Jesus is my king, not Caesar. You said, now I am renouncing my former life and everything about it. So I now belong to Jesus Christ. And so when we get baptized, they said when there were soldiers who would get baptized, but they would keep their sword above the water. <laughs> because like, yeah, everything but this sword, <laughs> I'm going down. Some of us, it would be our wallet, right, or, or our Apple Pay. It's like, I'm be baptized, but... Don't get my phone wet. Or I got the, you know, the waterproof case in my right? Got the waterproof case. But the point is, 
When we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ and we are baptized, the statement is, I no longer get to live life my way. It's for those who are getting baptized this afternoon, talking to you in particular, as you're thinking about the significance of baptism. And you say, I give up my old life and in exchange for the new life, my new identity, who God created me to be. So key truth about our identity, three key truths. The first one is when Christ gives us a new identity, we can live new lives. That means we can change. Sometimes you feel stuck. You ever feel stuck like I can't change, like I can't do any better, I can't be any better? When we surrender our lives to Christ, we get a brand new identity. We have the ability to change. And last week we mentioned the second one, lasting change begins with our identity, not our behavior. Oftentimes people want to change their behavior. Right? We say I want to save more money. I want always stuff that we want. I want to lose weight. I want to be married. I don't want to be married anymore. I want children. I wish I did not have children. <laughs> right? But we say, and we want things. But true change begins inside first with our identity. Because if we focus just on the behavior, that's not sufficient. It's when we change our identity. And behavior change is hard. Would you agree? Amen. And the problem is we focus on the goals, right? I want to stop smoking. I want to stop whatever it is. But we focus on the outcome without changing who we are. Last week, we got an example, right? I, if I'm trying to stop smoking, somebody offers me a cigarette, I say, I'm trying to stop. But someone whose identity changes what I says, I'm no longer a smoker. I don't smoke. You see the difference? I'm a different person, right? You say somebody invites you over to Netflix and chill, you say, mm, yeah, let, let's just watch the movie. Right? We said last week, I'm not a fornicator. That's a different statement, isn't it? Like, oh, <laughs> okay. Right? And so when our identity changes, and then we can change from the inside out, when how we think changes. So the secret to long term change is found in our short term or daily routine. Right? I can predict with fairly high level of accuracy. Your future based on your today. Right? Like, I'm reasonably sedentary. Pretty sedentary. I try to walk a little bit every day. But a sedentary lifestyle, fast forward, the people who are least able to get around when they're old are the people who did the least to get around when they were young. <laughs> right? The mystery is gone, right? We, we have folks who are healthy. Sister Paula is always dancing, Karen. She's flying around the place. She's mobile. Other folk, you know, you get a little, you know I'm 55. And why does everybody wants to be old? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know I'm 52. I'm old. What? And then you see like, you know, Brother John Scarborough. This guy's 80 years old. He's like, Phew. Sister Bernice. Phew, phew. Right? Because these are, they people stay active. They keep moving. Right? Real simple. You spend more money when your outgo exceeds your income. I can predict that you'll be broke. Amen? And I don't even have to get the prophecy or nothing. I can just tell if you spend more than you have and you do that for a long period of time, you will have financial problems, guaranteed. Right? And so the things that we do on a daily basis, if you spend time with God, right, as, we, as we're coming up on our plan for the year, I can promise you, based on this year's experience, that if you spend time in your word every day, and it's not hard, probably 15, 20 minutes max, but if you spend time in your word and you take that verse that speaks to you when you're reading, and that verse says something to you and you write it down, and then you explain it in your own words, and then you say, how can I apply that? Then you respond and you pray, God, help me that verse that you showed me that stuck out to me today. Help me apply that today. I can promise you, based on the last year, that your life will be better. Anybody else can testify to that? If you've been doing the word, man, I'm telling you, it will change your life. It's a habit. And so our daily habits. 
predict our future. And so here's how habits happen. First of all, there's a cue. There's something that triggers it. So for me, I leave my Bible and my notebook on my desk. So when I get up in the morning and I come downstairs, I automatically see it. So that's the cue. And then I'm like, wow, I want to read. What does God have to say to me today? If you think about your devotions or your quiet time is my daily meeting with God. Can you imagine? Like if God wanted to meet with you every day and would share with you what was going to happen, was going to equip you and prepare you for the day, was going to encourage you, was going to say something to motivate your day, wouldn't you do that? <laughs> okay, all right. All right, we got halfway through children's church. All right, all right. Okay, Cadence, my man, progress. Right? I mean, if we really believe that God wanted to speak to you, wouldn't you make a little time for God? Amen. He does. All the time. He says, pray without ceasing. God wants to talk to us all the time, much more than we want to talk to him, frankly. Amen. And so, for me, the cue, the craving, it's like, okay, I want to hear what God says. So the response is to read and the reward is, I'm prepared for the day. I'm geared up. Right? It's like you look outside and you see rain. You put on a coat or get an umbrella or something, right? And so that's the way all habits work. There's a cue. There's a craving. Same thing for things that are not great, right? I see a commercial. The commercials for cheesesteaks, for whatever. I, gotta, I love me some cheese. So I see a commercial for cheesesteaks. The craving happens, Brother Darren. <laughs> Have you ever left home because of a commercial? Any, any honest people now? Okay, a couple of us. All right, whatever. Or, or call Uber or Uber Eats. I, don't, I can't do that really. But right, but you, that, that commercial gets you. And you know it's never as good as it looks on TV, but there's something about it. And so you find yourself mobilized, getting up out of your bed, and getting in your car and driving across town for the whatever. Because the queue happened, the TV, the crate. And then you get it and you're like, ah. Oh. Right? That cold Pepsi. The queue, the crate. That's how it happens. And then how are habits repeated, right? How are they sustained? You do it over and over again. And that's how it becomes a habit. And then you do it automatically. I guarantee you, you get up in the morning, you probably brush your teeth, same teeth the same way, you shower the same way, and you ever get somewhere and don't even realize how you get, you get to work and you're like, wait, how did that happen? Right, because it's a habit. You don't even have to work at it anymore. And those are, that's how God wants us in our relationship with him. And not boring habit sense, but this is just who I am. This is my identity. I spend time with God. So let me tell you what doesn't work. So you see the 90%? 90%. 90 90% of resolutions by the, I think it's the second week of January are done. Right? Second week, anyway. Stretch it out to February. I'll give you that. But the vast majority of resolutions never happen. And, you know, we make a little bit light of that. But the interesting thing, 90% of people who have heart surgery because their arteries are clogged, the doctors say you need to change or you're going to die. And do you realize within two, three years, 90% of them have not changed at all? Take the little pill. People stop taking the pill. Eat better. People stop eating better. And what doesn't work, I'm going to tell you what doesn't work. Three things. First of all, fear. Right? You say to people, you're going to die. It's like when you tell people, you're dying and going to hell. What do they say? You coming with me. <laughs> or all my friends going to be there. Or it's going to be a party. Or whatever. Have there people or anybody said that to you? Because fear, you can't sustain fear, right? 
you, I mean, you make me afraid a little bit, right? I'd be like, what if you were to die today? I sense that somebody here is going to die today. You'd be like, well, let me get this Jesus thing straight. By the day, at the end of the day, you're like, cool, I didn't die. Business as usual. <laughs> because fear is not sustainable. We can't, that's too stressful, frankly, right? So at some point, you're just like, never mind. I give up. I'm going to die of something, Amen. right? Or if you're miserable, living is not that appealing. You know what I'm saying? We act like life is everything. But if my life is miserable, if I'm sick, I can't breathe, I'm stressed out, I'm depressed, you telling me I'm going to live longer, why would I want to live longer with this? And so fear doesn't work. Second thing that doesn't work is force, right? Having some authority tell you, so the doctor tells you, and you're like, okay. I mean, we listen to doctors a little bit. But at some point, you're like, eh. Or your parents, right? Did your parents ever tell you to do something or don't do something? And you're like, eh. Or your spouse has even tried to look out for you. You're like, go ahead. <laughs> right, so force doesn't work. It's not sustainable. And then facts. Facts don't work either. I just told you, 90% of people who have heart problems, they can just go ahead and do what they do. People are like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> right? They can get our attention for a minute, but if we're talking about sustained behavior change, who in here doesn't know that to have, uh, be able to retire, you need to save some money while you're working? Right? Is that fact? Aha uh -huh to anybody in here? You're like, what? I didn't know that. I got to exercise if I want to stay mobile. That's crazy. I'm trying to lose weight. I can't be on a, a pizza and, and, and candy bar diet. Are you kidding Right, the facts are not really lacking. And so those things are not enough. It really comes back to this issue of identity. So let me show you something. So this is how, when we attempt to change, the phases of emotion. So we have an emotion. When we try to change, so above the line we have optimism, below the line we have pessimism, and then we have time on the bottom, right? So watch this. Uninformed optimism. So when you decide you want to change, uninformed optimism, you decide you want to change, you're all excited, right? That's how it starts, the beginning of the year. I'm losing weight. Anybody get that membership? You're waiting because they're about to have the discount, <laughs> right? You're like, I'm going to wait till the, the first because the discount at the, at the, at the uh, overpriced gym is about to be only half overpriced. And here's what's true. They know you're not coming anyway. Right? We, them, some of the machines have been there since the 70s. They have not been worn out. Right? And so uninformed optimism, we're excited. We have, we have a picture in our minds of what's going to happen. Right? We have an, even a vision. That's what people tell you. Get a vision. And so we see ourselves happily married or we get rid of the person. We got kids. We have a uh, what, a white picket fence, a dog named Spot. We have all the stuff that we think we want, a big bank account, we're rich, we're famous. And we have this picture and this vision in our minds when we first start, right? And then what happens? We're like, oh, wait a minute. Right, because in our mind, here's the way it works. It's vision, results. Isn't that it? I get a picture in my head, magic happens, and I have my results. Oh, I forgot, we're, we're Christians. I get a picture in my head, a miracle happens, and I get the results. <laughs> but that's not how it works, is it? And so when we realize that it doesn't happen that easily, it's like, oh, wait a minute. I actually have to do something. Then we have informed pessimism. Right, the benefits aren't quite as important, not as real. You're like, eh, I didn't know I had to actually do something. Isn't that what happens when you're like, I'm going to stop eating sugar, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to save money, all that. When you actually start, when you go from just the picture to reality, uninformed pessimism. And then it gets worse. Then there's the valley of despair. Right? When the pain of change is actually felt. 
And that's the point at which a lot of people quit. And so you see, you see a little, watch this little line. This is how our emotions go. We start up here, drop down, and then that's the point when people are trying to change, oftentimes when they give up. Isn't that how it happens? That's how it happens with me. Right? You start something, you're excited about something, Reality kicks in, and then the valley of despair, I give up, I quit. But if you stick with it, then there's this idea of informed optimism. You understand that it's tough, but you're like, you know what? I want this bad enough. The vision is powerful enough. I'm willing to do what I need to do to do it. I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to put in the effort. I'm going to put in the work. And so when we've actually changed, it's when we've hit that bottom and we're like, you know what? I still want this. This matters. It's worth losing the weight. It's worth doing the extra work. It's worth getting the extra job. It's worth the saving. It's worth the reading. It's worth the learning. It's worth taking the class. It's worth whatever it is. Anything that we ever really wanted, we went through the cycle, but we persisted. Right? Was there somebody you really wanted and it got hard and now you sit next to them? <laughs> or somebody you wanted to get rid of and it was, got really hard? And now you're not sitting next to them? Or did you set a goal, right? You wanted a degree. You wanted a new house. For the most part, none of that stuff is easy. Would you agree? But you had to put in the work. You had to do the work. And so then the little curve goes up. And then we finally reach success. And you experience the benefits. And now the change has happened. And you can go on to do something else, right? Or so uh, let me do, let's do the translation. So that the first step, let's go. <laughs> Next is like, wait, what? <laughs> then it's never mind. <laughs> I give uncle. Then I got this, and then yeah, boy, right? Success, and that's the that's how it happens. That's how the change. For all of the changes that we try to go through, that's normal. And it's good to know in advance what to expect to happen, right? So real quick, three facilitators of lasting change. I'm going to run through these and we'll have to maybe revisit them again. First of all is reframe your thinking and go to bcpgh.info and the information will be there. I need to finish up because we're going to baptize. So first of all is reframe your thinking, and we'll get to this, the scriptures in depth. I'll develop, I'll, I'll de develop it more deeply. But that means repent, to change our thinking. That's what the word means, to think differently. Do you know that? Then the second one, review and revise our relationships. The people who you hang with, the people who you spend time with, they will affect you positively or negatively with regard to your goals. Amen? That's what the scripture says. And number three, repeat effective practices. Do those things those habits that will get you where you want to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen? Amen? And so now if you can go to, you go to bzpgh.info, the whole thing will be there. We can spend a little bit more time developing that. And then finally, so our application for 2024, reframe your identity. Your daily time with God. Reframe your identity. If you spend time with God, I promise you, he will change your thinking about yourself. The next one is your relationships. Your relationship with God, first and foremost, your relationship with your group, your D group, your small group, your Bible study. And then finally, key advisors and counselors. If you're trying to do something different, talk to somebody who's, if you're trying to do financial stuff, talk to a financial manager. If you're trying to talk to somebody about health, if you're trying to get your health together, talk to your doctor. Talk to somebody who deals in the area of nutrition. If you're trying to get your mind right, talk to a therapist. Talk to somebody who can give you support in that space. Talk to, your, to a pastor. Talk to someone who will give you counsel. And then repetition. And so the things that we're going to do over the next 30 day, 31 days, beginning in January, fasting, prayer, the Hero Journal, small group, coming together Sunday, or word and worship. That's the application. I promise you, without guarantee, without fail, these three things, these three facilitators of behavior change, if you engage them deeply, God will change your life forever. Amen. Amen. Praise God. 
Maybe there's someone here today who you've never surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Ask that our prayer partners will come. Today, if you desire prayer, we would love the opportunity to pray with you, pray for you. If there's something that you are asking God's intervention for, ask that you would come. The one who desires prayer. not going to be here too long because we do want to go outside and participate in the baptism. There's one young lady coming for prayer. Praise God. Is there another? All right, let's pray. Praise well, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, I give you thanks for today. Thank you for the opportunity to spend time with you and your word. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be challenged, but also to be instructed on how we can experience the abundant life you desire for us. And so, Father, as we prepare to celebrate your birth, we're reminded of why you came. We thank you that you came to destroy the work of the enemy, that we could be free that we don't have to fear death, but we can realize who you created to be, us to be. God, we thank you that you came to help us have a new identity in you. But God, we don't have to stay the same because you said if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. And so God, because we are brand new, we can erase those tapes, those videos, those things in our mind, Lord God, that are not like you, those negative things that people said to us, those things that people did to us. Lord God, we're able to forgive people because of the new identity we have in you. We don't take that for granted, but we give you thanksgiving. So God, we thank you that you sent your son to pay the price for our sins and to demonstrate your love for us. And so, God, as we leave today, I want everyone in this place to realize that you love them and that the reason that your son came, the reason that he died on the cross was to demonstrate your love for us. And then in so doing, he wiped away our sins, purified us, and made us holy before you. And he declared that we are your children. That is what we are. So, Father, I thank you for allowing me to be your son. I thank you for making me your own. I thank you for erasing my past and giving me a bright future. And I thank you, Lord God, for that gift for everyone under the sound of my voice who may not yet know you. Pray that they surrender their life to yours. Lord God, and as we go into the new year, that they will prioritize you, that they will seek you first. They will make your kingdom pursuit the number one priority of their life. Lord God, that they'll spend time with you. That they'll commit to spend time with other believers. Lord that they will read your word, participate in fasting. Lord God, if there are things that you desire to change in us, that you will use the time that we fast where we seek you. We reduce our food intake that we can increase our intake of you. And so, Father, we love you. We give you thanksgiving. We give you praise, give you glory and honor. We pray this prayer in the name, the power, the authority of Jesus Christ, our King.